inspired us? I can hear you. Hello? Yep. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm going to answer her question also. Can you hear me okay? Yep. So, Hello. favorite episodes were the two that I directed, selfishly. And, uh, and then there was one where I had to go tell a mother that her husband had been killed in a car accident and the little boy was there. And that little boy was my own son. Uh, so it was really sad. It makes me cry just thinking about it. But uh, so that was, those, to answer your question, to answer your question in ter terms of inspiration, you know, you wonder, I wonder anyway, maybe not all actors, I always wonder, what in the hell did, did why did you want to be an actor? You know? It's kind of like a high paid beach bum. You get to play house all day, kiss pretty girls. Um, you know, one movie I got to kiss Farrah Fawcett. That was tough. <laughs> Another movie I got to kiss Catherine Bach. That was tough. Dukes of Hazzard. So anyway, what made me want to be an actor? What inspired me? I met this old lady named Lois Hour in Beverly Hills. Who I grew up in Wyoming, and I would. I grew up with English manners, where you say, yes ma'am, and no ma'am, and please, and thank you ma'am, please be excused from the table, and then I was anachronism, meaning I was kind of out of place being in Beverly Hills with manners, I wasn't a wise ass, you know, <laughs> and uh, so she took a liking to me, she got me an agent, and then I started in Lassie, and I did Lassie for three or four years, and learned everything about cameras, and camera direction and f-stops and all this technical stuff that I wanted to learn because my whole life I've been a sponge for growth of energy of brain power if you will and qualitative efficiencies and everything that I do so it was a great by the time I got to chips you know I got lucky and I didn't really want to do chips but uh, I started thinking I was an actor right like the egos do at a young age and uh, luckily I stayed and did chips and I, I'm humbly uh, very grateful for ended up doing so. The lady that I took acting lessons was my inspiration, notwithstanding self-indulgence and ego, but Ponch uh, will tell you his story. <laughs> All right, we gotta go way back to Spanish Harlem, New York City. Uh, it's where I grew up. Um, I was four years old. My mother fired my father because he was stuck on the needle. That stupid Puerto Rican, he got on the needle, so she fired him. And then she started dating a cop. So, of course, Papa wanted to be a cop after this man came into my life. There are only two men in my life I ever loved, my grandfather and this cop. And then at 17 years old, last five months of high school, there was a pretty girl named Christine Laporte. Real fine, real pretty. And I wanted to meet her. So I waited after school so I could walk into the bus, the train, whatever. She would never come out of the building. So I said, I'm gonna wait tomorrow. Two days in a row I waited, she never came out. Third day I said, I'm gonna follow her after eight period, see what she's doing. She was going to drama club after school. And I said, ah, I grew up in Harlem, I can act. Just audition, get in, get the girl. I auditioned, I got in, and I got bit in about a week by the acting bug. And that's how I wanted, then I wanted to be an actor. But I had to go back to the projects and tell mom, Ma, you gotta live in the projects a little longer I want to be an actor. I know me, oh no, but follow, oh no. She went out of her mind, my mother. And I said, no, Ma, I gotta give it a shot. I really like it. I really enjoy doing stuff and people coming back and saying, oh, I like what you did here. I like what you did there. And I would appreciate that they enjoyed what I did. But they felt what they felt, but none of them, had, none of them felt what I felt while I was doing it and I wanted more of that. So she cried and cried and I said, Ma, I'll make a deal with you. If I can't make any money in this acting thing to get you out of the projects 
and have you living the way I want you to live, like my queen, you know? Then I'll come back at 30, go to Albany, because 32 years old is a cutoff date to become a police officer in New York City. So, uh, I got into the acting thing, because I want, I want you to live great, Mom. I want you to live awesome. So she cried and cried and cried. Then I started doing extra work, playing background in the movies. I used to make $27.15 a day. And I started getting those checks all the time in the mail. My mother went, Papo, mira esto, que es esto? She, she got real happy. <laughs> and then a movie came around called The Cross and the Switchblade. I was 19 when I got that movie. And then, uh, then I got another movie, and then a Hawaii Five-O, oh, and then I, did, I was still living in New York. And then I finally just moved to California and chased the career, and then I got chips. <laughs> I, had, I had to go in to read with him. And I'm waiting outside in the parking lot at MGM in a pickup truck, a Datsun. Dotson pickup truck. He pulls up in it. And I'm looking, and then I'm looking real. And he's got a bale of hay in the back and a saddle, a horse saddle. And when he got out of the car, I said, Hi, I'm Eric. You got a horse? I'm from the city, the streets, you know? And his, he's from the country. He's got a horse. I couldn't believe it. So anyway, we got on, we, were, we did it, we got picked and we went on, then I took care. I took, because of that girl that I was chasing and decided to not become a cop then, I went after the career, the acting, that's how I got into it. And that's my story about doing the acting thing and how I got involved. But thank God for that pretty girl, man, because my mother lived really well. For 32 years, I took care of everything. Yeah. Good boy. Good. And today I'm a real cop, by the way. Amen. Fairy County, Virginia. I'm a deputy sheriff. Nice. Nice. I went back. Um, hi, I'm Grayson, and I wanted to know, out of the two of you, which is the better motorcycle driver? Oh. Who's the better lover? Grayson <laughs> would like to know who Motorcycle driver! <laughs> oh yeah, Eric doesn't even, he already knows. There's not even a question. So John's a good driver. Larry was better, because Larry had like eight motorcycles also besides having a horse. I rode the subway. <laughs> and uh, also I wanted to know if you could sign my copy of Chips that I got from Musical Chairs. Sure. But I'll, I'll tell him a little story about Eric, okay? Yeah. So, you know, he asked about who rode the motorcycle better. And to be honest with you, I had ridden a motorcycle before I did chips, lots of motorcycles. But I went through the California Highway Patrol training with Eric. And we both became really good at riding the motorcycle, almost cocky. And uh, so we could do little figure eights with brake and clutch right here on this table, you know, just really, really balanced and, and riding the motorcycle with balance, which is harder to ride a big, heavy police motorcycle going slow than it is going fast. Anyone can go fast. But I, I'll tell you a story about my partner here real quickly. We. Did we wreck the motorcycles? Yes. Did we fall off the motorcycles? Yes. Sometimes, not very often, but once in a while. And then they wanted to do close-ups and they couldn't figure out how to get the camera so we were both in focus because when you're on the motorcycle, you're moving. So they put us on a trailer, but the evolution of the trailer was transitional, meaning that phase one trailer, phase two trailer, phase three trailer were all different and phase one was dangerous. So we would go around a corner once and it pitched me off the trailer because the wheel was on the ground in the back, but the front wasn't. So it doesn't go around corners. It just pitched me out in the air. So one day I'm in my motorhome, I don't know, primping or something, right? Sitting in the motorhome 
and I get a knock on my door, Larry, Larry, you gotta come, hurry, hurry, you gotta come, Eric's been hurt. So what, what do you mean, hurry, come on outside. So I went outside and Eric had a near fatal accident on the motorcycle, meaning to answer your question, if you wanna ride motorcycles, you better be careful because what happened is he rode the motorcycle and it high sided, it came up like this, threw Eric into a car and then hit him in the chest with the whole motorcycle, broke his sternum, you know, punctured his lungs, and he almost died. They gave him last rites at the hospital with the priest. And I, I went to the hospital with him, and he'll tell you a little bit about that. But my point is, is that he was a great rider. He, uh, he was, excuse me, he was a great rider, but everyone can be a good rider you're going to go down as a matter of time so i'll let eric tell you about his accident what larry didn't tell you is that he saved my life that day because he had been in nam he's a ex he's a veteran he had been in nam yeah and um the bike a thousand pounds crushed me because I was in a chase after a car. And uh, it punctured both my lungs, cracked my sternum, cracked my jaw, but this, as you can see, was broken, still broken. <laughs> and I was on the ground, and I was turning blue from bleeding internally. My lungs were getting full of blood. And Larry came over and he grabbed me and he said, hey, hey, Look at me, look at me, don't close your eyes. And he said all the things that he, in real life, experienced as a Marine. Until the helicopter came to get me, put me, in a, put me on the gurney and fly me to the hospital where they wanted to open me up because they thought I ruptured my aorta and I wouldn't allow them to do it. So they shot dye in all my veins and x-rayed me and this was okay but I did puncture both lungs, and I was in intensive care out for seven days in intensive care. Every day on the news, it would be 50-50 chance Estrada will make it, the doctors, the da 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 Anyway, I had an out-of-body experience while I was in the bed, and that's another story for another Comic-Con. <laughs> and that's, you know, I'm here today. But he saved my life because he kept me, I could have, I could have eased the way there on that street, in the alley where we were filming. So, he saved my life. That's a part of Yeah! Hi, I'm Gary. Um, you see so many actors over the years, the, the age things are told, how do you guys take such great care of yourselves? I look so good. Well, I try to follow Poncho and look in the mirror when he does, see what the hell happens. I don't know. Yeah, college and baby. Uh, my wife's an Olympic track and field athlete, and uh, she's really into nutrition, right? I don't really care. Uh, and so she gives me all the great uh, the juices in the morning, you know, like I'll get up and. Uh, beet juice I have, you know, it opens your arteries for blood flow and ginger and celery juice and all that stuff. And then, you know, once in a while I'll pull something out and say, what are you doing? So what do you mean? Look at the ingredients on that stuff. It's all just crap, right? A bunch of chemicals. And so I now I see how many drink up in the grocery store reading ingredients, right? I don't want a spanking when I go home to eat. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, exercise, I walk every day in the hills. You know, I don't really jog or work out anymore, but I walk and uh, I think everything you can do to keep your heart, to uh, reduce the sugar and fat that you're all eating. You know, I used to always eat ribeyes. And if I eat meat, I tried to only eat fillets, you know, and eat fish. So any and all of that helps. But most importantly, I think it's about you know, I thank him, uh, but I think it's your attitude towards people because, you know, I look in each of your eyes today and yesterday when you came to see us, and if you were in front of me, I look into your eyes, but I'm not looking into your eyes to flirt, I'm looking into your eyes to see your spirit and your soul, 
and hope that I hugged it and I loved you today and said thank you. So yeah. God bless you. That's too bad, Larry. You're missing out on flirting. <laughs> no, listen. Um, when I moved to California chasing that airplane to be an actor 52 years ago, actually 52 years ago, I was 22 years old. So I would, to keep my head screwed on, I got you next. Uh, I would, to keep my head screwed on, I, I got into jogging, then I got into weightlifting, then I got into karate, then I got into rolling disco, then I got into disco. And I just kept busy physically. And I ate everything and everything. But at 72, I'm 70, I'll be 75 next Saturday. But at 72, yeah. I was diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes. Too much sugar. My, in the process of the sugar in my body, it's a little slower than a lot of people that aren't. But everybody's headed in that direction. Everybody's going to be type 2 at one point or another in your life. So you got to be proactive about your food. A lot of things that we eat turn to sugar. And so your body has to work it. And if you got too much sugar all the time on a steady basis, it, it can't catch up to process it and piss it up. Pee -pee it, <laughs> urinate it out. <laughs> so I got it under control and that whole thing. So, but I was in a car wreck last year, not our fault, the person in front of us. And I, then a, like a week later, I had something I never had before, uh, vertigo. I got vertigo and I said, whoa, what is this? So I went to the doctors right away, emergency, da, 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 da. my blood sugar was bad, my A1C was bad, and my blood pressure. So then I went and had a caught the top caught doctor at Cedars. Uh, he, uh, 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 cardiac, cardiac doctor, so I wanted to check everything. And, the and now I gotta get a stint next week. Now, no big deal because today they can, you sit there and you go, come on, hurry up, I gotta go. And, and they do, they put a thing in your vein, vein in your artery, and it goes right up here, and it goes to wherever you want. I got a, I got a clogged artery, it's about 80, 75, 80%. No big deal. Everything else is good. So you gotta stay proactive about who you are, where you are, what you eat, and get checked out because I had, hey, I had a good run till I was 72. I was healthy as a mutt. I'm still healthy. But now, as you get older, stuff starts to break down, you know, because of what we ingest. So be proactive about your food, your stuff. You know, have your chocolate cake, which I love, at night. <laughs> Not every night. <laughs> and, you know, and you'll be around. So. Here. We have a question for you from this scale. Let, let me just in, in, go ahead, finish. Excuse me, real quickly. So, I want to just tell this story real quickly about to answer your question about how you stay healthy, right? I'm not going to stand up, but I'll just sit here. So, last night I had a little incident in my life I won't bore you with uh, crises of my own, and I wanted to be alone. I'm kind of a loner anyway, but I like to be alone. I can think and be introspective and so on. So I go have a dinner at a really nice restaurant. Various people came up and were kind and asked me to come have dinner with them. And, but I didn't want to. I wanted to, my heart was weeping, so I need to weep alone, right? So I was weeping in my own indulgence, if you will. And I had this really good French bottle of red wine, which I shouldn't have had, but I had it anyway, right? And as my way of wallowing in my misery, I'm getting to the point of what you asked me, right? As I'm walking home, a bunch of things go through my mind, some good, some bad. Part of Vietnam comes back sometimes and certain triggers happen, right? And in the Marine Corps, we were right on the DMZ, so I'm walking back and uh, this 
African-American guy is approaching me, right? And I see his hands are in his pockets. So this was last night, I don't know, late. He and I were the only ones on the street. So the Marine in me checks my six first, right? See who's behind me. Nobody's behind me. I try to see if he's right-handed or left-handed because I can know how I'm going to counter. And he starts pulling out something. So I'm, now I'm ready. I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to take out his trachea because he can't, I'm not going to get killed here, right? But I haven't done anything, but he's triggered my radar, right? And then he says, hey, hey, man, could you, could you, I says, well, what is it you want? You need some money? No. I, I, can you read this? Everyone I ask when I walk by, would they please read this? I said, well, what, what, you know, I wasn't really happy with him. Right? I don't kind of want to expose myself by grabbing that paper in case I needed to do something, right? So finally I said, yeah, okay, I'll read it. What is it? Well, I said, what, what is this? What is it that you want me to read? It's like four lines. I read the line. You just got out of the penitentiary. And it says, you take this to the bus stop. This is for $7.65 to get on the bus to go to wherever he was going to go, right? My heart stopped. And I said, oh, shit. I'm sorry, man. I said, what's wrong? I said, oh, no one will read this. And I don't have the seven bucks. And then when you get out of the penitentiary, they don't give you money. And now it could have been a con, right? So I pulled out 20 bucks, gave it to him, said, grabbed him by both put both hands on his back of his head where, you know, it was a problem. You could headbutt him, right? <laughs> and I said, I want you to know something. God loves you. And I love you. My heart loves you. My heart loves you more than your heart loves yourself. You start loving yourself and be a leader. And don't depend on people to read your friggin' note because they aren't going to care. You start showing them that you lead yourself and have a great day. God bless you and walk off. That's what makes me happy and feels good in life. I get to hug a human being. That's what's great. Not that I'm a Boy Scout. Just that it was fun good to do. Boy. All right. I'm going to get this scale here because she's been waiting. And then I'll come up front. Okay? This is for you, Eric. Eric, the weapon of that is Español. Okay? Okay, estás casado. Tienes hijos. Tengo dos hijos, una hija. Okay. ¿Y qué es tu favorita comida que comer? ¿Qué te gusta en español? Comida mexicana. Rabo encendido. Oh. It's a Cuban dish. Pig's tail. I like that. I can't wait. And rice and beans, of course, and plantains. Yeah, yeah. Platanos. <laughs> Tamales. Tamales también, niña. Y chilis relleno. Oh, sí. Mi favorito también. Sí. Ok. Bueno, que tenga buen día y que pasa bien. Y también, y gracias. Gracias, mijo. Okay. Adiós. Well, you got, baby. Hi, my name is Josh. First, I would just like to say thank you for the memories of my childhood. As you guys mentioned, you guys were a big influence. My parents both watched. And of course, we all did. Uh, my question is, other than chips, what were your favorite things that you guys got to perform in throughout the years? Uh, Eric will tell you he's had some neat ones. And, you know, everyone's kind of different. I'll, I'll try to be fast so I don't bore you with a bunch of indulgence. Um, you know, even in Lassie, when I first did Lassie, I called my brother, I grew up in Wyoming, I called my brother Randy, and Randy, this is Larry, hey, I'm starring in the television series. He says, you are? What's the name of it? I said, Lassie. He said, you're not the star, the dog's the star, you know? <laughs> okay. So that was, you know, a little humbling, and uh, I remember the first girl that came up for an autograph, I think I wrote a letter instead of my name, it's like, dude, what are you writing all this stuff for? I, I didn't give people an autograph, didn't know. After that, I did uh, lots of te television commercials, and those were all fun, you made good money, you know, you make sometimes six figures a year, and you only work one day, right? So that was great. 
I probably did 20, 30, 40 commercials a year. I did all the Union 76 commercials with this kind of dumb guy, Billy. Yeah, hi. You know, he's one of those kind of guys. And uh, so that was fun. Uh, we worked like a week, a week and a half down in San Diego and do uh, those for a year. Uh, then after that, I got to do uh, a movie called the, the Last Hard Man with James Colburn and Charlton Heston and Barbara Hershey. And I played this kind of dorky guy that wore a, you know, I got to act. It was fun to, to be an actor and to be kind of this dumb shit, excuse my language. And then uh, after that, I got to do Dirty Dozen with Lee Marvin. That was great. You know, uh, he was in the Marine Corps and I was in the Marine Corps, so we had a little camaraderie. And then after that, of course, uh, I did uh, various movies with Farrah Fawcett, the Great American Beauty Contest, and a bunch of other things that I won't bore you with. So each one had a little ingredient of intrigue. And sometimes it was learning that you didn't do as good a job as you thought you did. Sometimes it was, you made a lot of money, and man, this was a great job. Uh, one time I got to fly in A7s and did war games against F-16s in the, in the Air Force at, uh, up by Denver. And that's probably the best one. That's a longer story, so I won't get into it. But man, oh man, and almost got to eject. So we, our nose wheel went out, and so we are going to have to eject through the canopy. In A7, you go through the glass. So they have you put your visor way down. But to make a long story short, we had a hook, and the Air Force guy was a Top Gun pilot. Never landed with a hook in his lifetime, he said. So when I say eject, eject, Larry, eject or you're going out. And then you'll pass out because there's so many Gs, 225 Gs per second per second. So I was ready to eject, right? I was going to say, dude, I got to eject today, right? But uh, we caught the hook, so it was a good thing. So that was probably the best one. Thank you. I'll let Eric tell you what he liked the best. <laughs> I don't like anything. <laughs> no. I think I liked... I liked a lot of the stuff that I did, but I liked my first first movie. I was 19 years old. I auditioned for it. True story. Uh, I played a fella named Nicky Cruz, who was a warlord of the baddest ass gang in the state of New York, in, in New York City, called the Mau Mau's in the 50s, late 50s, street gangs. Back then, gangs were we always had an S and a C on the jacket in the name of your gang. Uh, your, the SC was so the cops would, wouldn't bust you, meant social club. So that'll keep the cops off you if you're walking down the street. And gangs back then, we used to, well, they, you, you, <laughs> you would settle your differences with your fists, you know? And once you had enough, the other team won. And that was it. Not today. The gangs today are not gangs. They are traffickers, drug traffickers, sex traffickers, and they all carry guns. You got 11-year-olds carrying guns, okay? That's, that's the truth and the fact of it today. So this movie was called The Cross and the Switchblade. It's a Christian movie. And Pat Boone played the cross, and I played the switchblade. <clears throat> and I auditioned six times, improvisation, and I got the job, and it was great. I made $800 a week for eight weeks. And my mother was so happy. So, but that was one of my favorite. I got a list of them, and it just took too long, you know? Next question. This question is for Larry. Did you play on MASH? She asked if I played on MASH. Yeah, we were just speaking uh, while Eric was telling you the story. We, you know, we both did episodic stuff on different shows. I, I did MASH. I did uh, one murder she wrote every year. And then I, I would get it. I would tell him if you let me play a weird character, I'll do it. Right. So I did uh, Hotel and MASH and Love Boat and you know all those shows back in the day. And, it was fun. MASH was really fun because all those actors were superb actors. Really, every little detail they wanted to rehearse and talk about and intellectualize about. So it was a fun show. Uh, 
Hey, were you on a talk show? Like, the late night show? The late night show, like, Jimmy? Yeah, I, I did Johnny Carson, Jimmy Fallon, uh, Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, back in the day, I, I co-host with Dinah Shore, Mike Douglas, Merv Griffin. I, I've done that stuff. But I didn't have my own talk. I was always a guest. You're probably thinking of somebody else. I think I know who. I remember seeing you on I was oh. going to ask what movies were you in. Oh, Jesus. Here we go. Airport 75, Midway, New Centurion, Scorsese Switchblade, Trackdown, Fire, and a bunch of other independent movies. Yeah. Lots of them. Lot, lot, lot. Did you keep any props from your shows or do you still have a motorcycle? I have one motorcycle. I have a chips bike. Uh, it was given to me by the Teamsters at the end of, of the series as a gift. Uh, <laughs> and I said, you don't got to give me nothing. We're all here to get that paycheck. What do you, you know, I'm here to get, make money to take care of my mom. You know? They said, no, 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 no. We're very happy. You know, you, you always got his new caterers and the crew didn't like him, the teamsters didn't like him. Uh, they were always good to us. And I said, well, okay, all right, give, give me one of the bikes. So they put together one of the bikes out of spare parts of the six years, and they gave me one of the bikes. Because they were very happy and they insisted because all of them had new cars, new jet skis, new boats, new homes, new wives. Very happy. <laughs> so, and first and foremost, my name is Jay Tavius. Very nice to meet all, nice to meet uh, everybody. Uh, so, in your tenure, both of y'all tenures in being an actor, what is something that y'all are very grateful to have experienced and to say that y'all have been a part of over your tenure as an actor? And as far as for someone that is pursuing acting, what is uh what is something that y'all would advise? What's some of the advice? Yeah, maybe. Um, trying to be honest here, I don't know. You know what I what I think I. But I think the most important thing for me, anyway. Everybody has a different answer, probably for this, even in the audience, but. For me, it was learning to cut out emotion and start addressing logic. And um, emotion is sometimes really problematic in life. And, it, and then you combine emotion with ego and it's just like gas on fire, right? It's, it causes all kinds of issues and fear and so on. So I think that the best thing I learned is to control that emotion and that ego to answer your question. What, what would be the, I think the second question was, what would I recommend somebody as a senior or as a as an actor? One, oh, just wants to get into acting? Well, for I think, you know, it's a hard transition. Like, how in the heck did I, from Wyoming, of all places, end up in Beverly Hills broke and get into acting? I mean, how is lucky? Well, I met that old lady, took acting lessons, all I knew, like Eric, is all the pretty girls were in the acting class, in one class, right? So naively, that was the uh, naive rationale. But here's how I would recommend someone, uh, whoever they are, right? Number one is, is that you want to put together your assembly of tools. What are the tools? Well, your resume, your bio, right? Your photos, different looks. You don't have to be pretty boy. You can be pretty boy, ugly boy, comedic boy, all of the above, right? And then the third thing is start doing reels on yourself because today with a cell phone, you know, we used to spend three hundred thousand dollars on a commercial. You can do it for this for five hundred dollars or twenty five hundred, right? So these things are really good. So I would shoot. I would have someone shoot me if I were you in a couple scenes, right? And now somebody says, "Let me see your reel. What was your acting reel?" And now you have an acting reel. And the last thing I would do is. I would volunteer for free in the beginning to do a commercial. 
produce it, direct it, and star in it if you have to. Right? And even at my age, sometimes I've done that where I produce, direct it, and so usually I don't star in it because I'm at a point in my life I really enjoy anonymity. But anyway, um, you, you wouldn't think so. Here I am on with the microphone, but I do enjoy it. So if you could do your little reel on yourself, that would be another transition. After that, you got to just be aggressive and send it out to agents and people and try to make a network because you probably don't have a network in the beginning. Who do you call? You don't know anybody. How do you get started? Well, you have the tools. Now hit them with the tools and see what you can drum up, you know? On what Larry was just saying, nowadays, back in the day, you audition for a role. I'd go up for a role and you'd have the casting director, you'd have the producer, the line producer, the director, the writer in the room and you would read with the cat with the, with the person who cast you and you would read live so they would see you, they would smell you, they would feel you, they would taste you. Today, I don't audition anymore because I don't give a hoop anymore because Today, they want you to put yourself on film or video to audition for a role. Now, how are they going to see you? You're one dimensional. You know, I'd rather have be in the room with you so you can feel me, baby. Mm. You know, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> so, you, you know, so. This is, so what he, everything he said to you is right on because you're gonna have to get used to that. Because if you wanna go up for a role, they're gonna ask you to put yourself on video. We're from the old school where we audition in front of people. Today, they want actors to be going up for a part. They want you to put yourself on video. So that's how. As for your first question, as I understood it was, what was it that we dug about what, who, where? <laughs> I, uh, I tell you what I really liked about all this, being into this and getting into this. First of all, I had a lot of motivation to make money. I wanted to be a cop as a kid. But I got sidetracked because I got really bit by the acting bug. It really, once it taps you, you're hooked, man. You gotta go get that satisfaction of performing. You just, if you got motivation, you'll get there. My drama teacher at the school, I got so into it that I won the drama award at graduation in high school, right? And so, my drama teacher was Rita Broadley and she had been teaching for 30 odd years. And I told her that I want to be an actor. I want to chase it. She said, well, you should go to college, have something to fall back on. I said, no, I want to be an actor. I don't have time to fall back. I got to go now, I got to go for it. But I had a lot of motivation. I wanted to get my mother out of the ghetto, out of the projects, off of welfare, and have her living like my queen. And I was able to do that. And most boys and girls want to do that for their parents. I get that. So, but when I got bit by the bug, I had to find a way to make money. How was I going to make money? <clears throat> so I started doing extra work. I started auditioning. I started going up to parks. And I started getting stuff. But the great thing about all of it is that me and Larry are in a position that we can go to any city, any town, do a little fundraiser, raise some money for a cause. That's, that's, that's personal and that's rewarding. That's what comes from it. You know? That's the stuff I like. That's my own thing. I'm a cop, not because I want to be butch, it's because that's my passion. And I only loved two men in my life, and that was my grandfather and this cop that my mother dated and brought into my life when I was four years old. You know? A lot of people don't know that I'm a cop, and a lot of people don't know that I pop guys off the internet. That's what I do. I'm an ICAC investigator. 
internet crimes against children. Because I don't go on TV shows and talk about it. I, I won't. That's, it's my personal trip. If that's what you want to do, brother, you go for it, man. You go for it. Make sure that you want it for you, for here. If you want to be motivated from something around you, but it has to be positive. My mother was a positive motivation to make money and go for it. You know? But at 30, if I hadn't gotten there this way, I'd have been a New York retired cop by now. Maybe, <laughs> or, you know. All right, guys, we have time for one more because we're running out of time. One more question. Hi, um, I'm Sadie. I was wondering, have you guys ever dealt with like anxiety while trying to perform on screen? And how did you deal with it if you did? I, <laughs> I don't know how you guys convinced the horns. I didn't have any anxiety. Um, you know, when you're performing on screen, um, you know, sometimes the only anxiety is when you have a lot of lines. So you have four pages of dialogue, you have that, all that memorized. And, you know, it's some dialogue's easy to memorize because there's a story in it. But when you like chips, we sometimes it'd be really boring stuff. Like, uh, we got a 15 7 Mary 3 on the ETA, about 210, but it's like, what? We got a whole bunch of chemistry, so yeah, technical stuff. So, but other than that, I didn't know anxiety. The only time I had anxiety is when after Chips was done, I went to New York and did a play for three months, True West, at the Cherry Lane Theater in the Village. And it's the same thing every day, the same lines, same stuff. And you're on stage, I could hear somebody whispery, rattling paper, whatever, and they used to, well, it used to, I didn't like it. I didn't like it because I, it, 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 I had to stay in focus, in focus. When you're on a movie set and you're filming, if somebody talks over you while you're filming, you do it again, and you move on. On the stage, you can't, so I had to work twice as hard to stay focused because all my senses were like really sensitive and I could hear everything out there. Hated it. That's the only time. I'll tell you one real quick was with, you know, working with actors, usually it's okay. You have, sometimes you have some prima donna that's hard to work with and, you know, he thinks he's God's gift and so on. But anyway, you deal with that, he or she. But when I did Lassie, it was hard because I would have to say a line and they would have to match his bark so his trainer would be over there, Lassie, Lassie, and he's like, dude, shut up. You know, I'm trying to save my life. I couldn't say that, obviously. I had to be a gentleman, but that, that was some anxiety. 